All right, it's so great to be here with you tonight, Lakeway, as we um, finish up the Heaven series. We're in the final installment tonight, and so what I want to do as we finish it up, I kind of want to go back to the beginning and walk with you through where I was at and kind of my thoughts that I had and the questions I had walking into this study. And so about eight weeks ago, give or take now, I remember hearing about the study and what it was going to be, and I had a few questions. And so um, I had three of them. So the first one was, do we have enough content? Is there enough content in God's word for eight weeks of a Bible study about heaven and then eight weeks of a sermon series on heaven? I would say that's a resounding yes. Um, I had no idea all the many different facets of heaven um, that we were able to learn through the scripture, but that would be a resounding yes. And so the, the next one was, is knowing about heaven, going through this study, is it really going to make a difference in my life? I, I know that heaven's this place. I know that there's this guy Jesus there, and all believers get to go there, and it's going to be perfect, but does this really make a difference in my life? And then the, the last one was, is this study going to challenge me and push me outside of my comfort zone? And so as I begin to think about those different questions, I realize that they're very similar to questions that I had back in high school. Uh, Back in high school, I was a football player. Um, I know that might shock some of you. Uh, I would love to say that I was, uh, had superior athleticism or that my vertical was six foot and that any ball you threw at me, I could catch. Uh, But sadly, none of that is true. Um, And the the fact of the matter was is that I just come from a small high school and so they needed football players. But nonetheless, I was a football player. (laughs) And so as a football player, um, we go through the summer conditioning. So what this was is that we would go through these workouts to essentially prepare you better for what was going to happen during the season. And so going into these workouts, especially early on in my career, I remember that I had a few questions going into these as well. And they were very similar. And so the, the first one was, is do I really need to show up every week over the summer to go to these workouts? <laughs> being honest here, being vulnerable. Uh, And then the second one was, are these workouts going to make a difference in my life? Am I going to be able to see a difference from where I started in the summer at the end of the summer in August? Am I going to be able to see the difference? And then the third one's the exact same question. Are these workouts going to push me and challenge me um, in ways that I didn't expect? And so um, as I I reflected on those at the end of the summer, I remember that I would always get the answers to these questions and and that they would answer them in, in ways that I didn't really expect. But there, the, there was definitely times that I was challenged and pushed. Um, and through all of that, by showing up each week, I was challenged and pushed, and I was able to grow, and I was able to learn. And not only was I able to grow and learn, I was able to grow and learn with my team. We were able to become closer. We were able to uh, just bond and become better football players and become better men. And, and I think this study is kind of similar to that. That there are times during the study, I know at least for me and for my small group, that were challenging. That we had to persevere through them. We didn't understand them necessarily. But by showing up each week and going through it, we were able to grow and to learn together. And so we were able to, to go through, and these scriptures that once didn't make sense or that we would glaze over now made sense. And we were able to talk about them deeply and even, even explain them uh, to new people. And so tonight, I want to talk about what our response looks like. And so I remember during the end of the summer, in August, when football season would start, our coaches would always sit us down, and we would have this, the same conversation every season. Our coaches would tell us that now you've gone through these challenging times, and you've persevered, and you've been challenged, and you've learned, and you've grown. You now have an opportunity to use these things going into the football season. You can respond to the things that have caused you to grow, and you can use them now. And I think that's very similar to where we're at tonight, Lakeway, that we're we're finishing up the summer conditioning portion, but we have the entire season ahead of us. And and for us, the season looks like the rest of our lives. And and the beauty of of what we've been studying is that we know how the season ends. We we know that the season ends in glorious confetti and and in great beauty um, in in ways that we can't even imagine. We we know where we're going to end up. That's where our season ends. Our life, when we know now because of this study where we're going to be when our life ends, and it's going to be beautiful. But now that we've finished this summer conditioning, we have an opportunity to respond, to take these things that have pushed us and challenged us and move forward with them, and use them in our lives. And so tonight, we're going to talk about our response. And I believe by knowing our eternal salvation, and knowing where we're going to spend the rest of eternity, 
it, it makes it so simple because we are allowed to know our purpose now. By re- the way we respond is by knowing our purpose because when we know our eternity, we, never, we don't have to wonder anymore. We know where we're going to end up. And so I believe as Christians we have a very simple purpose. It's one purpose, and it's to know God and to make him known. So tonight, as we, we dive into this, um, I, I first want to start with this preface that as when Daniel told me about this, I, I began to think of different ways that I could present this that would be complex or, or theological, and I quickly realized that none of them would do th- this simple message justice, that none of this would th- that make it more beautiful because the beauty is in the simplicity of this message. And so tonight, I think the way we know God is by knowing his gospel and and what his story is in our lives. And like I said, I believe the beauty is in the simplicity. Steve Jobs, the creator of Apple, said this about simplicity. Simple can be harder than complex. You have to work hard to get your thinking clean to make it simple, but it's worth it in the end because once you get there, you can move mountains. And I think that's the challenge tonight, that we need to make our, simp- make our thinking very simple tonight and to understand what this story means in our lives because I firmly believe that the simple gospel can move mountains. And so as we begin to talk about this, we're, we're going to talk, um, talk about it in Ephesians 2. Uh, so Paul shares with us the, this gospel in, in a few verses here. And I wanted to say tonight that uh, has anybody gone through confirmation in the church? Raise your hand if you, were, you know, went through confirmation in the church. Yeah. So I remember from my confirmation, uh, what we did is, is we had to learn the books of the Bible. And then after we kind of learned the books of the Bible, we'd have these competi- competitions among us uh, to see who could get to a certain passage the fastest. Uh, so tonight, it's going to be kind of like that. I'm going to be bouncing around a lot. And so you might want to, you're going to be able to use those skills finally that you learned in confirmation tonight. Uh, So we're going to start, and we're going to stay in Ephesians for just a bit here. So it's going to be Ephesians 2, 1 through 8. Paul writes, And we were dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. So what Paul is doing here as he opens up the gospel is he's pointing back to 2,000 years ago. And he's pointing back to the original fall of man. So when God created Adam and Eve in, in the Garden of Eden, everything was beautiful and perfect. And in that, God gave Adam and Eve dominion over everything, but he gave them one simple commandment. Do not eat of this one fruit from this one tree. What does man do? They eat of the fruit. They, made, they didn't even make it three chapters into the Bible, and they've already messed up. Typical of man, right? So because of that, they, they did a few things. So what that means for us is that when they introduced sin into the world, that everybody else after that was going to be born sinful because they'd introduced it. And that's what, that's what Paul's talking about here um, at the end of verse 3 when he says, by nature, children's, children of wrath. We were by nature children of wrath. Um, And so that's what he's talking about, that we are all born sinners. And then another thing that this means in our lives is that because of the sin, that before that, God and Adam and Eve were able to walk together. God was able to be in the presence of man. But because of sin, God cannot be in the presence because God is perfect and sin is not. And sin is going against God's will. So he could not be, he could, man could not be in the presence of God any longer. And so we see this chasm, as it's often called, this, this gap to where we have this hole where we can't get back to God. There's um, a, a gap where there's no bridge, and we need to get back to God. And so that's what Adam and Eve did in the garden, and that's what Paul is referring to um, in these first three verses. Verse 4. But God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by, oh, sorry, by grace you have been saved. So what Paul's talking about here, I love what he writes. He writes these two words that I believe to be the most powerful words, to be at least two of some of the most powerful words in all scripture. He says, but God. And what he's referring to here is, as I just said, there's this great chasm and there was no way back to God, but 
only through God, only through only God could provide a way for us. And he says, but God. And I also want to point out what he doesn't say here. He doesn't say, uh, but your holiness, or but your effort, or but your works. He says, but God, because it's nothing of what we can do for God. It's what God has done for us. And so, now as we're moving forward in the verse 5 here, he says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive with Christ. And so what he's referring to is that we were dead, that there was no way back to the Father. But through Christ, we were able to get back. And so he's referring to Jesus coming down, living on this earth, living a perfect life that we could not live, and then dying for our sins, dying the death that we deserved. And that through that, through Jesus' blood, we receive the grace of Christ. So that's what Paul's talking about in verse 5. Moving on to verse 6. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so what he's saying here, he says, raised us up. So us would be believers. Raised us up. So what he's talking about here is actually the resurrection. So he's raising us up like Jesus. So he, the reason he says right here in verse 6, raises up, raised us up with him, him being Jesus. So he's talking about how when Jesus died, he didn't just die. He, he came back, um, and for three days he was in the grave. But after that, he rose and defeated sin and death forever. And, and when he rose, that's what he's talking about, that now because Jesus has risen, that we get to rise with him because of what Jesus did for us. And then in verse 7, he says, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So what he's doing right there is he's summing up in one verse the past seven weeks that we've been learning about heaven. For a coming time, what he's talking about is when heaven comes, that we'll be able to see the immeasurable riches of his grace and glory in heaven. And then in verse 8, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. So I want to start here at the end. He's talking about, like I said, that it was through Christ and that it was nothing that we could do. It's not anything that we could ever earn. But in, verse, in the beginning of verse 8, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And I know this kind of confuses people as to what saves me. Is it faith? Is it grace? And so I want to kind of try to break this down. It is grace that saves you, but the only way we can get to grace is through faith. And so... I want, to think, I want you to think about it this way. Most of you know I had a bit of an accident this summer, and uh, I hurt my arm. And so when this happened, I remember um, I fell off the ladder, and I came down, and I looked at my arm, and it was shaped in a way that I can't even describe to you. Um, and it was just completely not wrong. So I did what any normal person would do. I called their pastor. Um, <laughs> so Daniel comes, and he picks me up, and he gets me um, to the hospital, and we get there. And I get through the waiting process, but through all of this, uh, I'm waiting in the room for the doctor to come. I still haven't received pain meds. And I, I've never felt a pain like I wish this upon nobody ever. But it, there was this pain, and I remember there was this moment, clearly I wasn't thinking straight, but that maybe, maybe death was better than this. Like, like, this is so bad. Like, just take me now. I'm, I'm good to go. Um, and so... After that, though, um, I finally got back to the operating room, and, and the doctors um, did a really simple procedure because I dislocated my elbow. All it was was just a couple yanks on my arm, and it slipped right back into place. And, and after I kind of come to, they had given me some medicines finally. Um, I remember that I was, um, I was so thankful to the doctors, and I, and I was telling them how thankful I was that they were able to make my arm look right and in a way save my life because I really thought I might die. Um, <laughs> but you know who I wasn't thankful to? Daniel. And, uh, and it really, it's because Daniel didn't really do anything. I mean, it's the doctors that, that were able to save me or were able to help my arm out. But without Daniel, I would have never have gotten to the ER where the doctors could have worked on me. And so grace and faith are a lot like that, that there's no way to get to the grace to the saving without the faith. We have to have faith to get to the grace. So you have to have faith to be saved. And, and when you have faith, you're able to be faithful. Um, you're able to be faithful to God's calling in your life, and that calling is to make him known. So we're going to move into the second part of our purpose here. Um, and I know what some of you are thinking, that school has fried Austin's brain and that he can't count because clearly this is two purposes, not one. 
and you might be right, brain, my brain's probably fried, clearly I can't even speak, um, from school, but I, I do firmly believe that this is one purpose. I'm sorry, um, yeah, one purpose. And so Acts 20, Paul talks about this a little bit in Acts 20, 24. He says, but I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And so there's a few things I want to talk about here. So the first part, it points clearly to the fact that Paul knows God. Because he says here that I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. And that clearly points to somebody that is sold out for Jesus, that he doesn't count his life as anything. And so Paul knows Jesus. And look what he says here, not precious to myself. And the reason he says that is because he's, he's thinking about everybody else around him. Because Paul knows Jesus and he knows where his eternity is at. And he knows where he's going to end up. But he wants all these other people around us to come with him. And so he counts himself as nothing. And then the last part of this, he says, um, in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So this ministry that he has received um, is the ministry that we've all received. That the ministry that, that Jesus will we'll read about a little bit later in Matthew tells us that we receive as believers to make him known, to make the gospel of the grace of God known. And what I want to point out is that word receive. So clearly that Paul knows Jesus and he received this ministry from Christ. So meaning that he had to get poured into, he had to get this ministry poured into him from Christ. And this all points back to that people that know Jesus make him known. And also when we accept Jesus and we know Jesus, we, we have the Holy Spirit come into us. Jerry mentioned this past week. Do we remember? Is everybody awake out there? Shake your heads, yes? Okay, great. Okay, so uh, Jerry talked about receiving the Holy Spirit. And with that, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so when we receive all these things and we know Jesus, um, and we want to make him known, we receive the Spirit, we can truly live out the words that Jesus says in Matthew twenty-eight eighteen. And Jesus said, I'm sorry, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am always, I, I'm with you always to the end of the age. That is our mission. And I want to close tonight, Lakeway. I'm sure you've been wondering what this is back here with an illustration about our purpose and why um, our purpose is really one purpose. So, let's see how this goes. All right. This is going to be us. This space is going to be us as believers. And then here, in this magic bag, I have some ping pong balls. These are going to represent the fruit of the Spirit. And then this water here will be the living water that Jesus pours into us. Okay. So, we're going to go through this, and we're going to go... And we're going to name the fruits of the Spirit together as I, put them, as I pour them into um, this person. And so, here we go. Everybody ready? You've done your homework? This is love. Sam with me here. There we go. Joy. Peace. Patience. Ooh, some people are early. Man, look at them. They've studied. Kindness. Going to Lakeway every Thursday. Ah, goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness. And self-control. Eh, there it is, self-control. There we go. It's always the hardest one to get, right? And so when we know Jesus and we receive these fruits of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's come into us. Jesus begins to pour into us. And what this pouring can look like is maybe it's Lakeway. Maybe it's your Bible study. Maybe it's alone time with the Lord. But Jesus begins to pour into us. And I want to stop here and I want you to see what's happening to the fruits of the Spirit. Here, let's see if I can move this. This might be in the way. And so you see what's happened with the fruits of the Spirit. At once, when we were first new Christians, and when we first received the Holy Spirit, they were at the bottom. 
but through Lord Jesus and him pouring his holy, um, I'm sorry, the living water into us, we see the, the fruits of the Spirit begin to rise. We begin to notice them in our lives. And Jesus continues to pour into us. And sometimes you just need a gentle nudge from the Lord, <laughs> just like that. And now I want to stop here, and I, and I want you to see what's happened now, that the fruits of the Spirit are, are now higher than they ever have been. They're right here at the top. You're beginning to see them in every aspect of your life right here in this moment. But Jesus continues to pour into us because God never stops pouring. And watch what happens. We begin to overflow. Ooh. That was planned. That was planned. Uh, but we begin, we begin to overflow. And you see what happened to the fruits of the Spirit. They're, not, they're no longer in our own lives. They're everywhere. They, they, this, this bucket here I didn't mention represents the people in our lives. And, and when we're connected to God, when we know God, we begin to overflow. And with that, the fruits of the Spirit begin to overflow. So the love and the peace and the patience, you get to see that not only in your own life, but in others' lives. Because when we are being poured into constantly by Jesus, we have no choice as believers but to overflow. Because when you know Jesus, you make him known. Let us pray.